Proverbs, where was it? Proverbs 3, Proverbs 5, the strange woman, yeah, listen to this, Proverbs 5, verse 3, for the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as two-edged sword, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. She was the one who inspired, I don't know if that was Bon Scott uh, of ACDC, he wrote, I don't know who exactly wrote that song, but that song Highway to Hell was inspired by her. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. That's her path that, that all these people are on. You used to be on that path. Amen. God put you on a different highway. Amen. Highway to heaven. Amen. Um, huh? Not stairway to heaven. Um, turn to Revelation 10. I got something else in my mind too. Me and Sterling was in the office. And we was watching this documentary. I ain't kidding you. I'm just watching YouTube. I'm watching uh, just animal videos, animal behavior, especially animals that are in the Bible. And I'm learning something. Um, this one lion caught, what was it, uh, hyenas? There was a bunch of hyenas on his hill. He had killed this impala and went laid down to sleep it was at night and while he slept these hyenas were all over his impala eating it and so he jumped up and i mean he went and he he started attacking those hyenas and chased them all off and then he stood there and he roared for about two minutes i can't do it quite like he did and i'm not i'm i'm it wasn't one of those MGM roars either. I mean, it was low and deep and loud. And the commentators said he is proclaiming his dominion and his territory. And anybody that hears that is going to know it. And they're gone out of there. Okay? Revelation 10. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Uh, I may just do this one day and just kind of take you down the road of why I think that's Jesus. Okay? And, but he had in his hand a little book open. There's a clue. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. That is dominion. Because of the ten toes. Ten is the number for... Anytime you put your feet on something or somebody... You, you own them, all right? And then look at verse 3. And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. Woo! Still can't do it the way he did it. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And what that is, and number one, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And there are other lions out there. Okay? Satan is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And what, I, what I've been seeing is when a lion has a dominion, a territory, he's got his family, he may have brothers with him, uh, he may, there's probably five or six female lions, and then there's all their cubs, and that is his den, his clan, and the area that they're in is his area. And every now and then, Ron, another lion, usually a younger one, will try to come in and challenge that territory. Okay? So that is, picture that as being Satan, the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's there to try to steal away those cubs and those female lions from that one lead masculine lion. And there's going to be a fight. And if you've never seen a, you've never seen two lions fight, you ain't seen a fight. Because I mean, they are rough and mean and vicious and growling and biting and 
Usually one of them lions is going to be dead by the end of it. Okay? That is Jesus and our adversary, the devil. Jesus has his territory, his dominion. If his right foot is on the earth and his left foot, is that how it says? His right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. What is there left? Nothing. Okay? He owns it all. And the devil comes in and tries to steal his territory away from him. There's going to be a fight. He's going to roar. And that sends a signal, this is mine. And nobody can have it. Anybody tries to take it, there's going to be a fight. And Christ did fight. And he's going to fight again. Amen? Well, that's good. I, I may do a sermon on that. Study. I, I've been years since I studied lions in the Bible. And I didn't quite have a, a really good understanding of it. Um, yeah, Matthew wants us to pray for Paige. It's a long deal here, but she may be admitted overnight. She's at the ER right now having a lot of pain, so we're going to pray for her, all right? Anyway, um, when Jesus has his dominion over us, that dominion is going to be challenged by the devil. So you think about that and you pray about that, all right? And you just, you just kind of ponder that. I, like I said a while ago, I did a study on lions years ago. And I, I, didn't quite, I didn't quite get it. But a, after watching a little bit about how lions work and their nature and so on, I, I, can, I understand a little bit more about it. This, this Jesus here roaring like a lion. And there's a prophecy in the Old Testament. If you have a reference Bible, it might say that in the reference there. Are you getting a footstool? I want one. I know. I know. No, you're doing right. Yeah. Now, if any of you ladies want to come and just massage Jody's foot while we're having church, okay, that'd be all right. Amen. Now, if I see any of you men massaging another man's foot in here, we're going to have a talk, all right? Yeah, foot, yeah, foot washing service. Anyway, I just throw that. Study lions in the Bible. And then maybe read some things, read some articles on the Internet about lions or watch lions. On YouTube. Just kind of watch their nature. Watch how they are. God will give you wisdom in that. Alright? Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray for, uh, pray for Jody's foot. And she hurt that on the job. And uh, you're having some troubles. I, I'm having a hard time thinking you're having trouble with the United States Federal Government Agency. Okay? Finally got a claim number on that. Okay? So anyway, just pray for her. Pray for uh, Paige. Uh, over to ER, all right? Just lift her up before the Lord. Pray for one another. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. We thank you, Lord, for the, the wonderful, wonderful things that are in your word. Father, I'll never in this lifetime, Lord, I was so foolish years ago to ask you to give me everything out of the Bible. Lord, there, there is no way, God, that I'll understand in this lifetime or in a thousand lifetimes the riches and the depth of this book. Father, it is deep. It is wonderful. It is, Lord, it is past, and yet it is present, and it is future all at once. And Father, I thank you for, for giving us the Word, giving us things, Lord, to study, giving us things, Father, that capture our mind and our heart. We ask you, God, Lord, to fill us with some knowledge tonight. And Lord, bless us and show us just how real and alive the spirit of this Bible is. Lord, we prayed tonight that you'd bless Jody. God, give her healing. Father, be with uh, Paige. God, give her healing in her body. Pray, Father, Lord, that you would just bless the doctors as they examine her. Father, they'll be able to find out what's going on. And, uh, Lord, we ask you to bring the healing. Father, bless people in this church. Lord, they need it. Pray, God, that you would just give them grace and help and mercy, Father. Lord, you'd bless them from your word. Help us as you preach to us this morning, God, to... To begin to hearken more to your word. To listen to it. To obey it, God. In any area of life, Father, where we fall short. God, we ask you for grace and help to live out this Bible the way we're supposed to live. Lord, just bless your word tonight. Bless us as we study it. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Take your Bible. Turn to, uh, go ahead and turn to the book of Exodus. And let me run through this very quickly. Kind of catch us up on the speed as where we were. Last week, I gave you some homework, and that is to find out from the Bible um, where the real 
Mount Sinai was. Now, I know Helen, she sent me a text later that night, and she told me the answer. Now, I've already, some of you, if you listened this morning, you already know the answer. But who found it in their Bible before you heard it this morning? Who found it? Who knew where it was? One, two, three. Come on. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Okay? We'll study everything in this world pertaining to what's in this world to show ourselves approved unto this world. Study. That, listen, there's a world coming that outweighs anything in this world. Study to show yourself approved. God and the devil will take over where ignorance dwells. Okay? There, there are three aspects to the Bible. One is knowledge. That is gleaning facts from the Word of God. Knowing that David killed Goliath. Knowing that Noah was in the ark with seven other family members. Things that facts, trivial things out of the Bible. Okay? Knowing the facts, that's knowledge. Number two is understanding. When you assimilate enough facts and enough knowledge, God will give you understanding of how things work in the Bible. Understanding about God's nature. Understanding doctrines. Wisdom then comes as a result of God pointing, at, pointing out things in our life based upon our understanding of God's Word. God gives us the wisdom then to live out and have applied the things that we have learned in the Bible. Does that make sense to everybody? You cannot get wisdom without having understanding and you cannot have understanding without a knowledge of the facts of the Word of God. Become acquainted with your Bible. This is why I tell you, mark things out in your Bible. Underline passages in your Bible. And become familiar with your Bible. You may not be able to quote a verse word for word, but I promise you, you read your Bible enough, and you'll think of a verse, and you may not be able to know exactly where it is, but you can see it on the page. And you go be flipping through, and you go, there it is, it's in here somewhere, right? There it is, right there. Left hand corner, there you go, okay? And so anyway... Become acquainted with the, with the facts of the Word of God. God then will give you understanding and God will give you wisdom. Okay? But you've got to have the knowledge first. Study it and read it. God will do the rest. So, uh, uh, Mount Sinai is not in Egypt. Never was. They didn't move it. Okay? It's in Arabia. It's always been in Arabia. And all these Bible maps are wrong. Uh, I showed you this last week. This is the beach where they crossed the Red Sea. All right. This is uh, Pi Hahiroth in Exodus chapter 14 in your Bible. As I said before, there's one way in this area and one way out. And that is the way that you came in. God led them into a trap. God brought them out on this beach. And then God sent Pharaoh to this, to this uh, mountainous pass here. There's one way in here, and God put Pharaoh right at the entrance slash exit to this area and cut them off. So they got Pharaoh who's wanting to kill them on one side, and they've got the sea on the other, and, they, and, they're, and they're scared. And they start complaining, they start murmuring, and they start saying, God, you led us out here to just to kill us. We'd have been better off in Egypt to die there. We'd die with food in our mouth, all right? And they didn't understand how God was going to save them. So, in uh, let's see here. There's at this area, there's a little land bridge that I believe that when they crossed, God used this one area to, to go across there. All right. So let's see here. Let's start it in. Oh, let's pick it up in Exodus chapter 14. Turn there in your Bible. Exodus chapter 14. To me, this stuff is exciting. I like this kind of stuff. Getting the knowledge and the facts of the word of God. That way... False prophets and false teachers cannot beat you. They cannot beat you. Because you have assimilated facts and knowledge in your mind. And then God will supply the understanding and wisdom. I got, I told this story before, but I was up in Lansing, Michigan. And doing a meeting up there. And these, these false Hebrew roots, sacred name cult. They always came to these meetings. They always sat in that back corner there. And they were waiting to trip me up. 
And this guy handed me this Bible, Ron. He said, you ever seen this Bible before? I said, it's a King James. He said, it's based on the King James. And in my mind, I went, eh. Okay? That's not, and what it was, they had taken out the word Lord in every place there. They removed it and replaced it with Yahuwah. Which, in their version, was how you pronounce God's sacred holy name. And if you don't say that particular name, God's not going to hear your prayers. So he shoved that at me, and I looked at it for a minute... And I just turned around and walked off. I thought, well, I'm not going to get into it with these people. But they forced the issue. Toward the end of that meeting, I asked, is there any questions? I just I had completely forgot about them. And they said, yeah. T t tell us what's in Acts chapter 12. And I looked at them. I said, why don't you tell us what's in Acts chapter 12? And then he said, you tell us what's in Acts chapter 12. He just had an attitude already. So I had one right back. So I got my Bible out. And I saw what they were talking about. I was talking about the word Easter. And what happened was, a year before that, God led me to study that issue out. On why the word Easter was in there. Because what they were trying to do was, they were going to try to trip me up and make me look stupid in front of all these people. So that they could swoop in and claim some of these people into their cult. By making me admit that yes, there was a tr bad translation in the King James and it should have said Easter, should have said something else. That's what they were trying to get me at. And God had given me knowledge of this passage a year before that meeting. And I went, I know this one. I know this one. Okay? It's the right word. Number one, you know how I know? Rule number one. No mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two. And no mistakes in the Bible. Amen? All right, Exodus chapter 14. Verse 19. The angel of God which went before the camp of Israel. Who was that? The angel of God. Who was that? That's Jesus. Removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went be from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these. So that the one came not near the other all the night. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Boy, I like that. Amen. God prepared a way in the wilderness. God did that which was impossible. No Israelite ever thought or conceived in their mind that maybe God was going to open up a path right in the middle of the sea. No one had ever seen anything like that before. And here is God. Now watch this. God will do what you don't think of. That way when He does it, you'll say, that wasn't my idea, that was God's. I don't listen. I'm not praising me. I'm not worshiping me. I'm not thinking about how good I am. I never thought... That something like this would ever happen. And yet that's exactly what God did. God's ways truly are above our ways. And His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Somebody say amen. And then Exodus chapter 14. I like this. In fact, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn there because i got something else I'm going to throw at you tonight. Man, I love this Bible. I get excited. I don't know if you notice that or not. Exodus 14 now. Verse 26. The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horses. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength from the morning here, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came in uh, came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them, which means that God obliterated every single one of them. Listen to me. When it's your time to cross from Egypt over toward Mount, Mount Zion in heaven, when we have to cross the Jordan River, God is going to destroy all of our enemies. Before, listen, when we march into those gates, those enemies are not pursuing behind us. They're gone. God's going to get rid of every enemy that is against us. Enemies of sin. Enemies of pride. Enemies of, of evil spirit that are trying to destroy you and destroy your life. Even the last enemy, which is death. Because when you walk from this place to 
toward Mount Zion, crossing that great river that's between us and heaven. When you get there, God will have destroyed your last enemy, and that is death, which means you are not going to die ever again. And you're not going to have to deal. Check the microphone. All of you here. Caleb, come on. Time for you to get battery. We should have done it before church. I know it. Anyway, hurt. Come on. Ha! Get it. If I'd have told him there's a cheeseburger waiting in there, he would have gone a lot faster. I know that. Uh, look up here on the screen while we're waiting on that. This is the Red Sea. This is the Gulf of Aqaba. This is near Haiha Hira. There are chariot wheels sitting at the bottom of the Red Sea. And horse hooks and everything else sitting out there. They're, listen, they're there like God said they were there. Amen? What else would you have a cheeseburger in? No. No? I'm going to write that down. Anyway, uh, turn to Exodus 15. Oh, you're going to like this. Watch this now. After this was all done, after Israel watched all of their enemies perish in the Red Sea. And I want you to consider this. How many of us, other than Charlton Heston's version of it, how many of us have ever seen God open up a way in a river or a sea or a lake for us to walk on. Who in here has ever walked on water or anything like that and have God just... How many of you have ever physically with your eyes seen anything like this at all? I have not. Israel saw it. And then later on, didn't believe it or forgot it. If we're not careful... We who have not seen it may and can be guilty of forgetting it because it's the same God who delivered Israel who is delivering you. Same God. And He is delivering. You may not see it, but He is doing it. Paul said, I thank God who always causes me to triumph. Always. You are always triumphing. You may not feel it. You may not see it. And you may not understand it. But you have to trust this book. And understand that this book has got your name all over it. Every page is about you. 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 Here's you here. Here's you right here. Here's you here. Those days when you were very distressed and you opened up the word and God showed you something that was specifically for you has that has that place not been there for a hundred years a thousand years yes it has and yet it just seems like God wrote it just for you for that particular time in your life God can do that God can do this book is the book of your life and I want you to trust it even when it doesn't if, if you don't think that God is passing you through the Red Sea and He's going to destroy your enemies, just keep on marching. Just keep on marching. Because I promise you, you're going to see it. But be careful. Israel saw it and forgot it. Because when it came time for them to go into the Promised Land, they halted. And they said, we, we don't think we can go in there. These are the same, I mean, I'm telling you, these are the exact same people who saw Pharaoh drown in the Red Sea. Exact same people. So, people, be careful. Be careful about what's going through your mind. Chase it out. Cast it down. Cast down all those imaginations with some word. Okay? Get the word out and cast that stuff down. All right? That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to do tonight is to show you the reality of what this Bible says. This is not a book of fairy tales that we're just supposed to think is okay Nice, nice talk. This is real. This stuff really happened. This is human history. And, and God, I learned in Twin City Christian Academy that history is His story. 
meaning God's story. All of human history is the story of how God governs the affairs of mankind, and He does it well. Okay? In uh, Exodus chapter 15, I'm going to show you something. They got, Moses got so excited after watching the sea cave in on Pharaoh and all of his armies that he wrote a song. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. You know, hey, that's your heart. That is your heart. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. What color is fire? Red. Salt burns. I'm telling you, that, that Red Sea is a picture of God casting all his enemies into hell. And they're not coming back out. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. What's at God's right hand? His Son and His Word. And, the ex and in, the ex in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. See that? He's talking about fire. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, and mine hand shall destroy them. There are six things in this verse. I was counting them while I was reading them. Six things in this verse. Guess who Pharaoh is? Okay? Pharaoh's the beast. Now watch this. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchedst out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. You remember what the uh, harlot in Jericho said? Rahab? When the two spies showed up, she pulled them into her house and she said, Look, I know who you guys are. I know you're Jews. I know where you come from. Everybody in this town has been talking about you guys. Because we've heard how your God opened up the Red Sea and let you through. We heard how your God overthrew Pharaoh and drowned him and his chariots in the Red Sea. We heard that your God came down to this earth and visited with you and gave you his... We know these things. We know in this town, everybody's talking about it, we know that we're dead. And I don't want to die with those in Jericho. That is a woman who wants to be saved, people. And she believed the two witnesses, Old and New Testament, I think she married one of them. She's in the lineage of Jesus. His great, 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 great grandma. Okay? And uh, she, she listened to the word of God. The people shall hear. Verse 14, the people shall hear and be afraid. That's what I was getting at. Uh, let's see here. There's one more place I want to... Yeah, look at verse 19. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea... And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Now, she was not dancing like a slut. She was not doing disco dances or anything like that. She had a timbrel. She was singing. And they were leaping for joy. Look at what she said. Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now that's twice that that phrase has been mentioned. The horse and his rider. Turn to Revelation. Boy, I like this. 
the horse and his rider. Revelation 6. Mm, 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 mm. Get ready. Revelation 6, 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on it had, had, uh, sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat up thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Verse 7, And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse. And, on his, and his name that sat on him was Wyatt Earp. That's a... Jared gets that, don't you? No, that's a, that's a phrase from that movie Tombstone. He was pretty, there's, I could get into that. There's so much in there, okay? Anyway, I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and on his name, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill the sword with hunger, with death, and with beasts of the earth. Now watch this. Here in Revelation 6, the opening of the first four seals, you have the horse and his rider. The first horse is dominion. Uh, evil things taking dominion over you. The second one, take peace from the earth. Warfare and violence against God's people. Fighting, no one being at peace. All right? The third one, balances in his hand. Uh, measuring out weed and barley, food, lack of it, famine. All right? The fourth one is death and hell. These are all the horse and his rider. And when God is ready, he's going to take every one of these and cast them into the bottom of the sea. And they will hurt us no more. Somebody say amen. You ponder that. You think about that. You pray over that. Because I promise you, death and hell are a real issue. They get us. Sometimes we get afraid to die. We get afraid of going to hell. Sometimes we think because of things we've done, we're too bad. God can't, God, here's the devil telling you, God's not going to forgive you. He's tired of forgiving you. He's about run out of, he's about sick of you. He's about run out of mercy on you. Your account's about run dry. You're probably not going to make it. Why don't you just give up? And you've got death and hell chasing you like crazy. And one of these days, God's going to use you as the bait Death and hell is going to chase you, and when God saves you, he's going, to, he's going to destroy the horse and his rider. And they're not going to hurt you ever again. Nothing is going to hurt you ever again. This is why I believe that there really are chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea. I believe this event really happened. And here you say amen. Now, Exodus 19, turn there. Exodus 19. Are you here to learn something? All right. Verse 10. The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. It's a third day time prophecy. In fact, write this down. And when you get home tonight, go to your pure Bible search software and type these in. Third day and seventh day. Both of them are found exactly 52 times in 48 verses. Both of them. And both of them refer to the same day. The seventh day is the end course, the end day, the Sabbath day, of the 7,000 years that God has appointed for this earth. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The third day is counting it from the time of Christ to the millennial reign. 
which would be 2,000 years expired, and then we're in the third day. So whether it's the third day or the seventh day, when you count from Adam, it's the seventh day. When you count from the second Adam, it's the third day. Does that make sense to everybody? Same time frame. And they're, and they're found in the Bible the exact same number of times. 52 times in 48 verses. I, just, I think that's marvelous. Amen? So anytime you see a third day, think of this is going to happen on the third day. This is God. When Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah, it was on the third day that he lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar so off. He was looking into the future and saw Calvary. It was a foreshadow and a foretelling of Calvary. And by the way, it happened on the third day, and exactly 2,000 years later, Christ hung on the cross at the exact same place, was offered up for mankind. God's only begotten Son, just like Abraham. Take thine son, thine only son. Okay? So this, I mean, it just clicks together. Amen? So this is the third day, and then on the third day, the Lord shall come down. You see that? That's the second, that's the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people... Round about saying, take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount and touch the border of it. Don't touch the border. He put a border around Mount Sinai and he said, don't come near this line and don't touch it. Period. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. Think about it. Beast. The beast is going to try to ascend to the holy mountain of God. And when he does, God's going to shoot him through. He's going to stone him. What happens to the image of Nebuchadnezzar from Nebuchadnezzar's dream? What happened to it? It was stoned. A stone cut without hands landed and destroyed the toes, which caused the thing to fall. Okay? All the stonings in the Bible, the law concerning stoning someone in the Bible is a foreshadowing of how God is going to destroy the power of Satan and sin in the last days. The stone is Christ. Boom! Attacking the ten toes, the dominion. All right? Uh, let's see here. The beast. Uh, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Underline that. You know what that is? That's the sounding of the trumpets. Seven trumpets. Okay? When are we going to come up to the mount to last trump? Okay? I believe we are. I believe we're going to go up at the last trump, exactly the way the Bible says. Okay? Uh, let's see here. Look at verse 18. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. Uh, we don't have time to look there, but you can write in Revelation 9. A star falls from heaven. To him was given the key, the bottomless pit. And when he opened the pit, smoke arose as the smoke of a furnace, great furnace. Okay? Hell being opened up here. All right? Now, take a look up on the screen. These maps that you have in your Bible. The red line there, pretending that Mount Sinai is somewhere near the, south, the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula. Your map is wrong. Here's another one. A map, the traditional route of the Exodus. It shows the Israelites crossing the... Uh, Red Sea in the wrong place. Then going down to the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula to where they thought Mount Sinai was. Here's the area. Here's a picture of the area of what they call Mount Sinai. All right? There's just not a lot there. Not much to look at. And they're wrong. It's in the wrong place. I think... Probably the Catholic Church had more to do with naming this than anybody else did. I don't know who did it, but whoever did it must have been drunk or something. Because they got it wrong. Alright? Now, 
Here is the real journey that they made. They leave Ramses, they go through Succoth, and they turn and go down to pi Hahiroth. Instead of crossing the Red Sea in the Gulf of Suez, they cross the Red Sea at the Gulf of Aqaba. That's where that beach was that we saw. And from there, they went to Mount Sinai, not in the Sinai Peninsula. Because here's what Paul said, Galatians 4, verse 25. For this Agar, meaning Hagar, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Plain as day. Amen. Plain as day. The Bible said it was in Arabia. It's not in Egypt. Never what? God didn't move it. Paul didn't change it. It was always in Arabia. They left Egypt. They left Egypt. Mount Sinai is still in Egypt. God did not leave them in Egypt and give them His law. He took them out of Egypt. Then gave them His law. And He, he met them at Mount Sinai. There is a place called Jebal al-Laws. It's an Arabian term. Here is a mountain. And I want you to notice, there are two pictures here. One is a zoom out and one is a zoom in. And you would think that darkened area there at the top would be like a cloud that's blocking the sun. Here's a close-up of that mountain. That is not a shadow of a cloud. The top of that mountain is charred black to this day. Jebal El Laws, or that area, uh, there were some things I read said that Jebal El Laws is the area, but it's Jebal Al something else that's Mount Sinai. But it's in that same area, and it's in Arabia, exactly where Paul said it was. Paul was, huh? They fit the, uh, the Saudi Arabian government, upon this being revealed and put out over the internet, stuff like that, they went and fenced this area off. You cannot get in it now. But before they did that, several researchers went to this area and discovered Mount, what you're looking at is, is the top of Mount Sinai. Charred black to this day because God said, your Bible said, that that mountain was on fire. It was burning, all right? Smoke came up off of it. Now watch this. Uh, turn to Exodus 17. Before they get to Mount Sinai, they get thirsty. Now they have crossed the Red Sea. They are in Arabia, and they are thirsty. So in verse 1, the Bible says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of Sin, which is Sinai, and after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this, that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Don't tell me you have never said that to God. Don't tell me you've never been angry with something God did that you didn't like. I have. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand what God was doing at the time. When I look back now, just like I'm looking back in the Bible now, God had a purpose for this. Who was that rock? That rock was Christ. Watch this. He was smitten. And the water of everlasting life flowed from him. Isaiah 53 says he was smitten. And when Christ was smitten on the cross, that, my friends, is what has provided the everlasting water, the, re the regenerative water, the well of life, that flows out of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives us life. Amen. 
So in uh, verse 5, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? You remember when Jesus came the first time? Israel, same thing. Is the Lord among us or not? Is he here? Because they didn't believe it. They did not believe that Christ was the Lord their God. They did not believe that he was the new lawgiver. They did not believe that he was the prophet that God spoke of, that he was the angel of the Lord. They did not believe that he was the Messiah. They did not believe these things, and they were questioning that. By the way, how many times did Israel complain about water and God use a rock to give them water? How many stories of that are there? First coming, he's smitten. Okay? The second time, Moses is instructed to speak to the rock. Moses disobeyed. He smote the rock three times. Water flowed anyway, but mo because of that, Moses couldn't go into the promised land. But it's a picture of the first and second coming of Christ. Okay? That, that rock is still Christ, by the way. Amen? Boy, I like this stuff. Take a look up here on the screen. Before you get to Mount Sinai, in this same area, is this rock. Sitting there in the wilderness. Split in half. The area around it, it appears that water has rushed out of this area. Okay? I'm not, listen, I couldn't make this stuff up. This, your, Bible's, your Bible's telling you the truth. The evidence is still there. Um, let me show you this. Exodus chapter 20. Once This is after God spoke to them and gave them the Ten Commandments. God said in verse 24, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Why not hewn stone? Man-made. The rocks, the stones used were Christ also. And they were natural rocks. Think of the stone cut out without hands in Daniel chapter 2. That stone becomes a great mountain, which is Christ and his kingdom. That stone is cut out without the hands of man. These stones that they built this altar out of were not hewn by the hands of man. Man does not make Christ who he is. He is who He is, and we accept Him the way He is. Amen? You accept it by faith. So at this area, in verse 4, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under, under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. There's remnants of the pillars here at this place and remnants of the altar with stones that were not cut out by the hands of man. Isn't that something? Just exactly the way the Bible says. And then verse chapter 32 of the book of Exodus. Look at there. Mm, 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 mm. Moses up on Mount Sinai getting the holy law. First thing out of God's mouth. Okay? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Any. Don't make them. So verse 22 of Exodus 32, And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people, that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For, as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. Now I always, I always thought that was kind of funny. Like Aaron was making this up. 
But can I tell you something? I believe it. I believe that this beast rose up out of the fire. Is what I believe. Okay? So, at this area, at the base of Mount Sinai, they carved into the rocks an image of a calf, a bull. There on the lower hand, where this guy's hand is pointing, is a Jewish menorah. Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven candlesticks on this thing. Just like the menorah in the tabernacle. The evidence that the Israelites were here is at that place. The evidence is there. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to bring this to... Here's the knowledge. God's going to give us understanding based upon this knowledge. And the key, to, the key to understanding is that you believe all the facts. If you, who in here has ever been in a jury? Okay? If you don't believe all the facts that the prosecutor has dished out, you cannot, with a reasonable, without a reasonable doubt, find the person guilty. If the prosecutor presents facts that you don't believe one or two or three of them are true, then in your mind there is a reasonable doubt that this person is actually guilty. You think that it's possible that they might be innocent because some of the facts in your mind don't add up. As a jury person, you're to weigh the evidence and if you believe the facts of the case has been laid out either by the prosecutor or the defense, if you believe the facts of the case, then your decision is based upon that. But if you don't believe, if you believe some of them, let's say the guy was in the area, but so was another guy who might be guilty. Well, that presents a reasonable doubt in your mind. Did this person do it or did that person do it? Who killed JFK? Who pulled the trigger? Grassy Knoll, sixth floor, who knows? It's a reasonable doubt. That's why nobody, nobody believed the Warren report on JFK. Nobody believed it because there's too many things that just didn't add up and didn't make sense. And what I'm telling you is, if you want understand, if you want God to give you understanding based upon what's in this Bible, you have to actually believe all the facts that God presents to you in this Bible. If you are hung up on one of them, Ask God to help you to believe it. That's what the disciples said. Lord, help our unbelief. Lord, increase our faith. Okay? But the bottom line is, you cannot have understanding and you cannot have wisdom unless you believe the facts that God has laid out. So, 1 Corinthians 10. Here's Paul's summation of it. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. How that all are... See that word ignorance? Ignorance is the opposite of knowledge. It's the opposite of knowledge. If you are going to be willfully ignorant, that means that you refuse certain of the facts that the Bible lays out for you. It means that you don't really believe that Goliath was 10, 11, 12 feet tall. You don't really believe that there were giants all in the land of Canaan. You don't really believe that there was a cluster of grapes being carried by two men. You believe that it was some sort of exaggeration, but you don't really believe that, that key fact. You don't believe that. And if you don't believe that, you cannot get the understanding and wisdom that you're going to need to make it in this life. Amen? Here's, I mean, what I like to do is just, and this is kind of what I plan on doing on Sunday nights for a while. Give you the facts. Teach you the facts. That way God will give you the understanding and He'll give you knowledge. He'll give you wisdom. I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Did, and what was that meat? What was it that they ate in the wilderness? Manna. Okay? 
is spiritual meat. It's the Word of God. They ate it. You ate it. All right? And did all drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Not pretended to be Christ, not was a symbol of Christ, not was a facsimile of Christ. It was Christ there with them, giving them spiritual water to drink. They drank it, you and I drank it. So here's what he's saying. Don't you dare say to yourself, well, that was his, and I've heard this, well, that was Israel in the Old Testament, and we're not under the Old Testament, so therefore none of that applies to me. Don't you dare make that mistake. Apostle Paul tells you, they drank the same water you drink. They ate the same meat you eat. They were all baptized like you were baptized. So then, verse 5, but with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted so just ask you just for a minute what's your golden calf what beast arises up as a result of your offering of gold, of your willful, sinful actions and activities. What beast rises up out of the flames that you follow? What lifestyle have you chosen for yourself? What is it that you're doing that you're just trying to forget about and make everybody think you're a Christian? Am I speaking to anybody here? I don't know. Am I speaking to anybody online? I have no idea. I'm speaking. And I'm telling you what this Bible says. They were, they were our examples. If you've got issues with lust, and I don't care what kind of lust it is, there's a million things in this world to lust after. Get it under the blood. Get it confessed. Ask God daily for help as you walk with Him. Because if you're not careful, God will overthrow you. We should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You can keep reading 1 Corinthians 10. You'll find all kinds of things. In fact, let me, let me get to the summation of that. 1 Corinthians 10. Here, I told you to be there and I wasn't there. Here's the summation. In um, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You make the mistake of saying, well, that's Israel in the Old Testament. That has no application for me. I don't have to do it. I don't have to, there's, there's nothing there that fits for me. I can do whatever I want to still go to heaven. Take heed. Take heed. God overthrew his people in the wilderness. Out of a million people that walked out of Egypt, two of them walked into the promised land. That's how displeased God was with those people. Isn't that a shame? That our churches are full every Sunday, and yet very few church people in this world are actually going to go to heaven. It's a shame. Amen. Turn to... Um, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It's real small on the screen. I'm going to make you turn your Bible there. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 18. For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched... And that burned with fire, and were into blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, which voice they uh, that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. And he's saying, the mountain that Israel went to is not the mountain that you and I are headed for. We're headed for a different mountain. Verse 20, for they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast... Touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. We just read that. There's going to be a beast 
who's going to try to climb that mountain. Okay? Maybe, for real, that may be why it's fenced off. Dun, dun, dun. Okay? Now, verse 21. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Moses was scared. But you're coming to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of uh, just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Somebody say amen. Not the old covenant. Not a renewed Mount Sinai covenant. A new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. Because that's what Israel did. God spoke and Israel said, stop speaking to us. How dare us do that? God forbid that any of us say to God, God, stop speaking to me. I don't want to hear it anymore. Amen? Well, wouldn't that be terrible? But I've known people that's done it. You probably have too. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. You see that? That's not written to some strange, odd people somewhere in billion miles away from here. That's written to us. That's got your name all over it. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. You know what's going to happen? God's going to shake the heaven so bad that angels are going to fall out of it. They are. Just like figs falling from a tree, God's going to shake the heavens. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So the question is, when God shakes heaven and the earth, are you going to remain standing, or are you going to fall with the angels? Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, not works. Whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. That's why Mount Sinai looked the way it did. And that's why it still looks that way. God, I think God left that as a record and a testimony to us. God said, take a look at that. See that? Because when I come the next time, it's going to be worse. And our God is a consuming fire. And I believe that we're going to be baptized with that fire. And if God is in our hearts, we'll remain safe while everyone else perishes. So two things. Number one, don't ever tell God, God, close this book on me. I don't want to hear it anymore. Number two, there are people you know who are in danger. Because God's going to shake the heavens, He's going to shake the earth. And when He shakes, they are going to fall. And they're going to perish. Do we care enough about them to try to warn them somehow, some way? If you can't talk to them, let me do it. Send them a DVD, send them a link to a video. Whether they watch it or not, that'd be between them and God. But if you care enough about them, give them the warning. I'm going to tell you a story about that, and then I'm going to be done. Uh, I went to see my brother-in-law one time. And at that time, he was very, very deep into the throes of sin. And I mean very, very deep. He's very, very, very wicked at that point. And God had laid it on my heart. Sterling was with me. I had a cassette tape that was about the judgment of God. And... God had just laid it on my heart to take it over to him. So we went over and talked to him for a while, and he had a bunch of people in his house. And he saw me with that tape. And I tried to give it to him. He wouldn't take it. And I set it on his counter, and he said, you might as well just take that thing back with you. That's what he told me. And I thought, oh, no, is he going to hit me? And God helped me. And I said, Steve, God told me to bring this over here and leave it. 
I can't take it with me. I can't disobey God. If you don't listen to it, that's between you and the Lord. But God told me to bring this over here. Now, I can't tell you whether he listened to it or not. But I do know that years later, God really got a hold of him. And he's in heaven right now. Okay? You don't know who God is going to save, do you? So our job in our ministry is to spread the seed wherever we go. Let God bring the increase. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Sweetie Pie, I want to know if we was done. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this awesome word that you give us. Thank you, God, for what it says. And Lord, thank you, God, that you've already fixed it in our heart, that we believe it. But Lord, it's just awesome, Lord, and wonderful when we can go through and look at the evidence and see that this Bible really is real. It is exactly what you say it is. And these things happen, Lord. And everything that man discovers in science, archaeology, whatever it is, it just testifies as to how right this Bible is. God, you wrote about the creation of the earth, and it's real. You wrote about the flood, and there's evidence of the flood everywhere. You wrote about your people Israel, and Lord, there's a record of that everywhere. God, you wrote about Jesus Christ, and there's a record even beyond the Bible of Him and His presence and His ministry. God, everything in this Bible is right concerning the past. So, Father, we believe everything is right concerning the future. Father, give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Give us knowledge of what this Bible says so that we cannot be conquered and we will not fall when you shake terribly the heavens and the earth. Bless your word tonight. I love these people, Lord. Be gracious to him, Father, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Good to be with you tonight. Amen.